too. Anyway, since we seem to be out of witnesses, I thought I'd drink a little. They are now recording. Hey, everybody. Cheers. Mr. Pollock, how are you doing? I, I, didn't, I didn't get a drink. Oh, well, I, I have a double, so perhaps that'll suffice for both of us. Yeah, I'm, uh, I've just been working diligently here at home this afternoon. Uh, you were here this morning, and now you're there this afternoon. Yeah. That's where I'm at. It's busy, yeah. Uh, stuff's going on. Yeah, I guess that's good. That's good. Yep. yep. So, um, uh, so we want to talk about uh, this COVID situation and the lockdowns and what that seems like in terms of is it a good idea or not? It's kind of... Yeah. So we've talked about COVID before, especially early on in our shows, uh, but we've talked more about is it serious or not? And, and what do we do about parenting and stuff like that? Today, we want to talk about uh, the actual, uh, yeah, the, the impositions that government is placing upon the public uh, to try and provide some protection or uh, perceived protection. Yeah, and, and, and what I think got us going, I did a, I did a Facebook post uh, yesterday morning. Uh, and, and it was in response to what I would call partisan stupidity. You've got a certain group of people that are saying masks are useless, COVID's not real, you know, there's this thing. And in, in part, I think they're responding to what they perceive as a political agenda from what probably would be characterized as the progressive left. And then we've also got this other, what I would call similarly hysteric, shut everything down, lock everyone in their homes. Um, this is about life or death and uh, there can be no quarter given for people who, you know, uh, don't follow the rules, including ratting on your neighbors and your friends, uh, kind of Joe McCarthy style, I think, from the I'm betraying my age a little bit. It was before my <laughs> day even. But, you know, the Red Scare in the United States, if you would, sort of pre-Richard Nixon. Um, and, and so I thought, well, I'm going to look at this a little bit, right? And so uh, I looked at a few things. And I looked into, there was a metadata uh, study on masks undertaken, uh, because there's very little actual controlled science on on masks, uh, but the metadata suggested that there's maybe, I think, a 17% reduction or something like that in, in uh, potential infection if people are using masks, broadly speaking. Um, okay, so it's not nothing. Um, and, uh, but the thing that struck me, and, and you kind of mentioned this, is I looked at jurisdictions that have the most strict lockdowns in uh, North America. And I looked at things at home here in Alberta and until this past week, uh, fairly loose, right? Uh, reduced capacity for restaurants, but the restaurants are open. I think theaters were even open. Um, gyms were open. Still are. Um, fitness classes were all open. I don't think anything was really closed per se. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Kenny was getting harangued because the numbers allegedly were going up. Um, and so we got these restrictions and I said, well, does this work? Right. Let's assume for the moment. Uh, and what what I found was um, in California and Washington state, you know, they're the they're the two strongest lockdown jurisdictions in North America. The infection rate as a percentage of the general population in California is 2.67%. And in Washington state is 1.85%. So in a, in a hardcore lockdown jurisdiction, we got 2.67 and 1.85. Now, what is it like in Alberta where we have a relatively uh, unrestricted uh, situation, although most places mandate wearing masks? Um, in Alberta, it's 0.94%. 
it is half of that in Washington state and approximately a third of that in California. And, and what that tells me is uh, it doesn't work. Now, whether it's because the COVID is of such a nature, and I'm not a virologist, but whether it's because COVID manages to get through these barriers somehow, or more likely whether it's because compliance is disparate in those jurisdictions, the bottom right. line is imposing restrictions we can see demonstrably doesn't reduce your rate of infection in the broader population. Yeah, I was looking at Canada specifically, and I think Manitoba has been probably the most strict as far as imposing, you know, uh, restrictions. And uh, they're not, per capita, they're not marked, markedly different than, than Alberta anyways. Uh, and Alberta has been more or less the opposite, I think, fairly, uh, you know, le less restrictions anyways, right? we got this conservative government and they don't get involved in the people's lives too, too much. So yeah, uh, yeah I'm not seeing a big difference. So I think I would agree they don't work. But I would like to, I would like to say this, we're not really talking about what our personal opinions are or perspectives are as far as is this serious or not. And I think you probably know this about me, Rob. I take this very seriously. I think it's a very serious virus. I think that it's transmitted easily. I think the consequences are pretty dire. I think we should all be very responsible. Uh, but then on the other side of this, I actually really don't think government has a place to be imposing restrictions on our liberties to the extent that they are, or or especially in other places where they are. And so I'm, I'm sort of funny, I'm two-sided on this. I don't want government to impose restrictions, but I really do want people to take this seriously. And I really do want people to have a bit of a conscience about this and have some personal uh, responsibility when, when it comes to this. And I think there's ways we can achieve that without, or maybe there's better ways we could try to achieve it anyways, without imposing rules on people. And you know, I, I was reading today, uh, Manitoba started a pretty strict lockdown. Uh, I mean, they've always been more strict, but they really started locking things down today. And they're saying nobody in your house that's not part of your immediate family with very few exceptions. And that to me is so scary, right? As a lawyer, yeah. having gone to law school, as somebody who knows, I mean, I'm not as smart as most of my friends out there, but somebody who knows a little bit about history and other things. I mean, that's, that's scary. That's not what you want to see. You want people to take some responsibility. So, yeah. And I think, and I think, and, and, and I would share your opinion that, uh, you know, when I have clients in, I'm wearing masks typically. Um, when I go to restaurants, I'm wearing my mask, I'm washing my hands. Uh, I have a very small circle of people I'm in contact with right now. Um, so I, I'm not one of these, let's just ignore it, it's not real. Right. But the reality is, you know, um, uh, the percentage of the population of Alberta who has died due to some influence of COVID, and I think it's important that when we look at those stats, the comorbidity is typically people have two to three uh, added comorbidity factors. That It's not just COVID for the vast majority of people who die, but, but l let's treat those as all as COVID deaths, even though it may be complicated by other issues. Those deaths amount to 0.009883% of Alberta's population. So it's, it is a very small number. Um, I, and I, okay, it is a small number. I won't disagree with that. It's too big a number. Okay, but here's That's the problem. And this is where I think we may or may not agree. Sure. We make a decision as a, uh, as a society that believes in freedom and liberty on many fronts that a certain number of deaths are an acceptable outcome of a free society. Would you concede that? that? We do it all the time. We do it. Um, the flu kills people every year, not as much, again, depending on how you see the COVID stats, but it would appear n clearly not as much as COVID. Um, I would say clearly not. Um, but we don't shut down and we've never shut down for the deaths of the result of the flu. And the inescapable conclusion is because society as a whole has made a decision that that number of deaths is acceptable 
uh, yes. without resorting to what I would call uh, state compelled quarantine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's a good example. Right. So, and, so, and there were some, some illnesses where we took precautions, you know, swine flu and, and there were, there were some illnesses where we took some precautions. SARS, which things, is very similar to the COVID. Well, it's a type. Um, yeah. Uh, we didn't, we didn't shut down our country. We didn't, um, there was no, you know, serve money. There was no border closures. Uh, yeah. So, you know, so the Other idea, examples would be so, so the idea, you know, what I find problematic and you've done, I don't even go on Twitter anymore because there's too many morons. Um, but you read the popular media and, and, and you get these people, you know, that say one life is too many, right? How can you put economics ahead of human life? We do it all the time. So let's not, not be naive. We do. We do. The question do is the, the balancing of factors, one of which is freedom. Now, the other of which we don't talk about a whole lot, and, and I posted this on my Facebook post. Um, in Alberta to yesterday, we had 432 COVID deaths. Again, the vast majority of those people uh, were elderly and had comorbidities, but ignoring that complicating factor, 432 people died relating to COVID uh, to November 18th, 17th. To the end of July, we had 745 people die from what I would call despair. And I call deaths from despair, suicide and opioid overdoses. Because in my experience, and I've had some some experience dealing with people with addiction issues. Uh, addiction issue, in, in, in my opinion, is a is a disease of despair. The people that are unhappy, that are having a hard time dealing with life, and so we've got uh, a massive number of people dying, maybe almost two to one, of these issues that can only be uh, enhanced because of the lockdowns because of the, the reduction of, of social interaction. Uh, now, some of those people, uh, they were probably going to die anyway. Again, right? It's good for the goose. Um, some people say, well, you have some 95-year-old guy who catches COVID. He was probably going to die within the next 24 months anyway. Well, a lot of these people, opi op you know, uh, opiate addicts, um, suicides probably were going to happen anyway. But I don't think anyone can deny that if people are losing their jobs and their ability to support their families, uh, if they're losing relationships in part because of their financial strains, um, that has a risk element too. And so, it, so what we get into is this balancing of, of two risks, risks of doing nothing and risk of doing something, both of which have negative uh, potential consequences. And then we have this broader question of uh, how much risk is inherent in freedom and how much are we willing to tolerate? And I think that's where, where you come from a little bit is uh, let's not pretend this is not a real thing. Let's not suggest that people shouldn't be diligent about reducing their exposure, particularly for people that have relationships with elderly people or people with higher risk categories. But to what extent do we let the state control ourselves and our ability to make a living, for example? Um, that's a frightening thing. I looked yesterday at the uh, Public Health Act in Alberta, and a lot of people don't know this because you'll, you'll hear people go, well, please show up at my door. I just won't tell them who's here and they can't come in. Well, a lot of people don't know this, but the Public Health Act in Alberta, and it's similar across Canada, allows them without warrant to enter your home. This is why we're talking about it on a podcast of a couple of lawyers, because the law matters to us, and particularly the idea of uh, state abuse of its authority is, I think, important to us. So people should know if the police show up at your front door because you got a poker game going or because you've got another couple having dinner uh, and you say, you're not invited in, show me your warrant. They can point to, I think it's section 30 or 31 of the public health act and say, I don't need a warrant. Dina Henshaw told me to come in here and kick your door in 
and I can enter. And then from that point, they can detain you for, for 24 hours if they have a reason to believe that you may be infected. And infected is defined as including someone who has a runny nose. It's in the, it's in the legislation. If you have a runny nose, God forbid you've got an ongoing allergy or a cat in your home. They can arrest and detain you without warrant for 24 hours. So they can investigate to determine if you are uh, infected, truly. If you or anyone in your home has been outside of the country, that is defined as uh, basically being infected. And again, they can arrest you and detain you for up to 24 hours. Um, now, this isn't in fact happening. Not that we know. I, 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 I haven't think heard. So. I haven't heard of, of the police, you know, kicking down doors, or jackbooting their way to the jail cells with people with runny noses. But <laughs> I think um, I think it's worth understanding that the government gives itself certain authority, um, and they're largely, uh, to some degree, unaccountable for that. Um, and so that's concerning. That's concerning. And there's checks and balances in our society for that. You know, media can play a role in, in checks and balances. The government system and the way that uh, laws are passed uh, is another way that we do checks and balances. And I think lawyers are supposed to be a bit of a check and balance too, uh, that we're supposed to watch and see what is the law and what's going on and how do we protect the public. And so this is a risk. That's that is scary, and it makes yeah. me sick to think that that's can, could happen here or anywhere. And, and I don't know what makes me more sick: the fact that you know people are having crazy wild parties and spreading this around, or the fact that the government could kick down your door and and watch it for twenty four hours. But it's not, yeah. none of it's good. I think yeah. the answer is individuals need to have some responsibility. And I would hope that we all do, I, you know, and some people have proven that wrong, but a lot of people have proven it right. Well, I think the, where I come out is um, I'm entitled to liberty until it's demonstrated with sufficient evidence that there is a fundamental basis to deny my liberty. Hell yeah. Right. Um, we, we, this isn't the Soviet Union today or pre fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, this isn't North Korea. This ostensibly is Canada. Uh, and while our, our human rights in Canada are somewhat specious compared to the United States, um, they still in theory exist. We do have a charter. Um, and so it's, it's a little problematic that based on everything I can see, there is no clear evidence that lockdowns advance the interests of reducing COVID. Um, and that, and, 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 and you're going to get pushback because people will say, well, in principle, right, obviously, if everyone's in their house and nobody's going out, how is COVID spreading? But people don't do that. No, exactly. you know, we've got huge swaths of society that have to work. People got to eat. So as we've seen with the cargo situation in Alberta, people are going to work and then one gets infected. Next thing you know, you got a batch of people infected. Um, now, some suggest it wasn't even at Carvid anyway, or at Cargill, that Cargill. people were socializing uh, on the way to or work, from work. Or... Um, but, but the point is, um, we have grocery store workers and clerks and nurses and doctors and truck drivers, and who knows what the percentage is? I would guess it's got to be 25%. Everyone but the clerks of the court are out there working in public, right? Yeah. He, he puts his head down, but you know okay. I'm right. My, my strategy is play nice with the clerks and they play nice back. And in fact, I really like all of them. Yeah. Except for those provincial court clerks in Calgary. I but don't my, like them. But my, my point is not that they're, I didn't say they're not working. I said they're not working in public for the most part. I'm which is a whole other issue. Sure. Which is a whole other issue, right? Uh, I'm on the board of directors for CBA Alberta uh, for the lawyer advocacy group. We are getting so much feedback right now saying, please explain to me why I can't go to court, why my clients can't get in front of a judge to get a reasonable support application in weeks. Um, I can go to a grocery store and put a mask on, but I can't put a mask on and sit in a courtroom uh, 75 feet away from a judge. To me, that's stunning when the foundation 
of our freedoms is supposed to be an open court system and it's fundamentally hampered because steps are being taken that exceed anything we see in the broader society. Like, can you tell me, is there another portion of our, our social experience right now that doesn't allow for some contact between patrons, I guess you'd call it that, and, and service providers? Can't think of any. No. And now here's the thing, right? There are now uh, electronic courtrooms yeah. and that's works fine for the most part. It works uh, not bad. Me. I'll give it to you. It works not too bad in Lethbridge. But the feedback yeah. we're getting from Calgary and Edmonton is it's hideously Well, and under we did an episode on this and I actually got kicked out of an electronic yeah. courtroom in Calgary, yeah. which was absolute bullshit. Yeah. I mean, absolutely an affront to justice. Yeah. Horrible, horrible thing that happened. And I, I, could you imagine if you don't have a law degree, you don't have those initials at the back of your name, you can't tell the clerks you're a lawyer or tell the judge. I mean, just imagine what it would be like to be a soft rep. And that's sort of a different subject. But, you know, I mean, we also know this, Rob, and, and I'm not allowed to, well, I'm a, I can say this, that, uh, you know, we received the electronic location of courtrooms uh, that we aren't allowed to provide to the public, uh, like a self-represented litigant. And that to me is horrendous. Yeah, explain that. No, well, it can't be explained. That is horrible. How, uh, you know. Now, yeah. provincial court, not court of Queen's Bench, right? Yeah. Uh, I see all sorts of self represented litigants in the court of Queen's Bench on. Oh, yeah. True. By backs or by phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, apparently, that doesn't work so well in provincial court. I'm not sure why, but. But, and whether they're but, there or not, I'm not exactly yeah. sure. How they access it, I'm not really sure. And, I do know I, yeah. And the bigger question though is, and I think it, it gets back to um, taking a, a, a measured approach to a significant issue. Right. And, it, and not ignoring the significant reality of, of people not being able to make a livelihood. I mean, is there, is there a fundamental freedom that goes more to the core of our humanity than being able to be employed and earn a living for myself or my family. Like, I, I don't think there is, right? I mean, short of actually putting people in jail and taking their liberty away completely, telling someone you can't work. Now, even if they're giving you money for serve, which not everyone can get, and from the people I've talked to, it's hit and miss, and now it's sort of connected to employment insurance and other issues. But even if um, you get that, you're sitting at home when you could be uh, improving Pretty your business. Advancing your career, yeah. And uh, having pride of, of what you've done to support your children. And now they're going to stare at you and go, how come you're not going to work today, daddy? Well, because the government tells me I can't. And, and to hey, downplay... Now, to downplay that is just horseshit, in my opinion. Some people are going to say to you, though, Rob, how many people could that be? The unemployment rate is worse during COVID's been, what, 15% or something. Uh, and a portion of those weren't going to work anyway. Uh, and especially in Alberta, how much restrictions have we had? Well, we've been. Yeah, but this is the free. sauce for the gander, right? How many people are dying, Tyler? How many were going to die anyway? And same people that go, well, two or three deaths is too many. Telling two or three people they're going to lose their restaurant or their fitness center um, so they can make a gesture, which is what it is, uh, in the public good, uh, that's problematic too. So, you know, and, and, and again, I'm not telling people to march without masks and, and that kind of bullshit. Those people irritate me as much as the people on the other extreme. But I'm saying, uh, if your MLA uh, is taking a relatively hands-off approach to lockdowns, uh, send them a note saying, you know what, uh, I appreciate your, your balancing of these nuanced issues, right? And I'm going to throw this out there. If your MLA is saying, shut it down, well, maybe you should fight, fire him or her a letter or email saying, uh, why don't you just shut up, maybe, right? 
Um, Look, I have two not... things in response. First off, I think that a single death that could have been prevented by taking even the most reasonable, prudent measures is inexcusable. If people are having big parties and that leads to someone's grandma dying, man, that just kills me. That is horrible, not excusable. But on the other side, there are other measures that we could be taking that are going to be more effective that would be less intrusive. And intrusion from the government, is, like I, I think we agree, not really acceptable. Uh, but there's, there's other measures we could be taking. And I think you and I talked about this in the last couple of days, right? Uh, look at Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, look at, uh, you know, I mean, you wouldn't see a, a super pregnant lady in a bar with a big tall glass of beer uh, without her being criticized by a whole bunch of people. There's a lot of uh, perception that gets changed through either public education or public influence that I think is a far more measured approach and, uh, you know, look at smoking, right? And, and some of that's legislated and I don't know if I love that, the fact that, you know, a certain percentage of every cigarette pack has to include a, you know, uh, you know, a gross picture of someone who's been smoking. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of things where public perception has changed because of influence that's been asserted on them. And some of that's been government funded or government driven. And I, I think that's a more appropriate measure to take. Let's try and influence people to make a good decision. Let's try and educate people to make a good decision. But understanding right. that that is, and, and this is, was my comment when you said one death. Um, the reality is you can educate people to the cows come home and people are going to be stupid, right? There are still people dying from impaired drivers and there always will be. Yeah. I mean, let's not be naive, right? Yeah. Um, 7,500 people a year are seriously injured or killed on bicycles in Canada. I just looked this up. Now, we can educate those people all day long and educate drivers of motor vehicles. And you're still going to have people dying every year because they're riding <clears throat> bikes on the roads, right? Yep. Is one death too many? Should we, should we outlaw bicycles on our roads? No. Right? I mean, th that's no. the reality, is, is the freedom to do things, including things that have risk, skydiving, people die every year, mountain climbing, backcountry hiking, people die every year, skiing, people die every year, bicycling, people die every year, swimming pools, one of the largest accidental deaths, drowning. Yeah. Let's outlaw bicycles, let's outlaw swimming pools, let's outlaw boats. We're going to save a shitload of lives. Okay, we do it all the time. My, my comment, though, is, okay, if you leave your infant child alone, beside the swimming pool, that's inexcusable. That death should not occur. Yep. There are certain deaths that are inexcusable. It shouldn't occur. If during a COVID, you think, let's all go to the bar and dance and whatever close to each other, that's a problem. You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, now, should the government be telling you you can't do that or that that business owner can't be open? No. Should people be taking some personal responsibility and not doing those things? Hell yeah. But there are those. But there's going to be people who won't. Right? Yeah. But there are those that will say, our office shouldn't be open. We should have to close okay. down. Right? And, and so when you say that, do you mean we shouldn't, lawyers shouldn't operate? Uh, yeah. Well, we shouldn't be able to meet anyone face to face. We shouldn't be able to have staff in our office that are in I contact. I would suggest it should be a pretty rare occasion that you find necessity to meet somebody face to face in our office. But should you prevent them from doing that? Oh no, you can't. Yeah. Um, should terrible. we prevent, yeah. uh, should we outlaw weddings? Period. No, of course not. Right. Um, now should you, but should you have a wedding and think you're going to invite all of your family on both sides and all get together and have a dance party at the end of the night. Yeah, but there is a point, Tyler, where the, the difference between 10 people and 30 people is of marginal relevance, right? Yeah, I don't disagree with you. So it, 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 and, and so again, I'm not asking, suggesting that we should be irresponsible or that we should ignore the risks or that we shouldn't be diligent, particularly, you know, I've got parents in my 80s, in their 80s, um, and I worry for them. Um, uh, I'm mostly concerned, though, that the 
the, there is this push from um, people that just love the idea of imposing their will on others um, to tell people they can't go to work, that they can't right. socialize, like you say. Mm -hmm. Uh, that if they live alone, they can have one other person in their home and that's it. Manitoba, yeah. Right? Like, uh, and so, and, and I always, you know, and I'm the libertarian kind of guy and I push back on this stuff, but I see what it's like, right? I've been a bencher with the Law Society of Alberta. I've been involved with government and I see how things work. And part of the problem is we've got a broad society that uh, sometimes is is afraid to take a nuanced approach to serious problems and that's all i think we're talking about is um don't be too quick to tell people to shut down when it might cost lives as well True. and when it may not do any good yeah um, i i do agree i think the enforcement or the the lockdown measures the impositions made by government don't seem to be very effective yeah i mean there's something odd right when in Alberta, I mean, you know, we're a bunch of crazy rednecks, stereotypically. Um, our rates are stunningly lower than California. Yeah. And Washington State. And, you know, I asked Marcy and she goes, yeah, well, they got a higher poverty density. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, those are factors. For sure. I looked at Fresno, 500,000 odd people, right? Smaller than Calgary, higher rates of infection. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think that the imposition works. I don't, it doesn't no. seem effective. Uh, but as much as I want to advocate for people's freedoms and liberties, I would want to advocate for social responsibility at yeah. the same time. And that's my point too. Uh, on my post on Facebook, you know, I, I said, put a mask on when you're out in public. Avoid, uh, you know, uh, socializing in larger groups. Um, distance, right? These common sense kind of approaches. Uh, I'm 58 years old. Um, I don't need to catch COVID, right? It, it, there's, there's no benefit to that. And even if that risk is 0.0089%, uh, my luck hasn't always been great in life. And I don't need to be the one in, you know, 300,000 that dies because, you know, I had to go to a bar and uh, sit at a table of 15 people. And I think yeah. that's, you know what, you're hitting the nail on the head here. There's a, there is some empowering, there's something empowering about what you just said. We do have choice. So on mass, if we can choose to be responsible, we can control this better. But even individually, if we choose to be responsible, we can control it better. And that doesn't mean you can decide whether you're going to get it or not, or it's your fault if you do get it. That's not at all what I'm saying, but you can certainly take steps yeah. not you know, to be, to be cautious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to protect the people around you. Yeah. And, 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 and so, you know, where I'm at is it's like, I, uh, when I was 19, my best friend got killed by an impaired driver. Um, and it was traumatic. Uh, but, uh, I'm not a big fan of mothers against drug drivers. Um, I'm not a big fan of what I've seen as a significant curtailment of charter rights in response to uh, impaired driving, even though it has uh, in, impacted me in a very personal way. Um, and we should be specific about that a little bit. Like there's a, there's really harsh penalties for suspicion that maybe you were intoxicated while driving, even without any consequences yeah. right i mean they're taking people's licenses away taking people's cars away taking away their ability to earn a livelihood without proof that they committed a crime yeah. right so there is that's what you're getting at and i appreciate that yeah and it's it's you know it, the thing that struck me i was an english major and and there were two books that people talk about all the time when when they're when they're ranting about government excess and the one obviously is 1984 by by orwell um, you know, where Big Brother sees all and is imposing its will upon uh, a beaten down populace. But the other is Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which is not nearly as well known. And it's, diff it's a more difficult read. But, but Brave New World, it, it, it is based on a government taking away your freedoms 
because you gave them to the government, because you are feeling happy and safe and content and you give up your freedoms willingly. And to me, that's the bigger risk. And that's when we're talking about uh, impaired driving laws, we're talking about some of this COVID stuff. Um, we get people afraid, you know, and, and that sells newspapers and clicks and uh, gets people elected. <clears throat> and then people go, I just wanna be safe. And the reality is there's no such thing. The reality is we're all dying, right? And so am I gonna give up my freedom uh, based on the illusion of safety? No, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have speed limits. It doesn't mean uh, people should be able to walk around, you know, beating each other with bats and shooting each other with guns. I mean, but uh, I think where this COVID thing is something we should really watch and we should really watch as the COVID, uh, you know, uh, diminishes, which it will yes. both if the quarantine comes through, but even with, without that, you're going to see it diminishing. And what is government going to do? Right. It's like Homeland security in the United States after the towers, Everybody was gung ho. Yes, terrorists. And next thing you know, um, we've got wiretaps and Edward Snowden and Obama reading your emails and right. And it's still happening. Yeah. But people gave it up because once a government weasels their way into power, they don't let it go. They don't give it up too easy. Yeah. And you're right. We need to we need to keep our eye on the pulse of this thing. You're right. And and. And I mean, the, the examples you gave about speed limits and whatever, we do give up freedoms mm -hmm. in exchange for safety yeah. or even perceived safety, right? Like maybe yeah. the difference between 40 kilometers an hour and 50 kilometers an hour speed limit, maybe it doesn't actually make a difference. And maybe it's just a perception of safety. And we give up freedoms for that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we start to see that moving or shifting more towards government power, we gotta keep our eye on the pulse of that thing yeah. And you're right, as COVID resolves, we got to watch what happens with that government power yeah. that we've yeah. been giving. So that's the point. Be responsible, point. be Please. prudent, um, but be diligent that your liberties aren't taken mm -hmm. away or worse, that you haven't handed them over uh, to some sideshow carny in the guise of your government uh, believing that you're going to be safe because you won't. I guess that's our point. So I think we agree on a lot, maybe disagree on a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, I, it, and this is kind of my thing is I've had conversations with hardcore uh, government imposition of controls. And generally, I can get them to at least acknowledge that it's a difficult and a nuanced discussion after you think about it for a while. You know the, and that's all we want. I think I, for everything, yeah. right? That's that's the thing I find so irritating. Whether we're going to talk about uh, COVID or gun control or climate change or all these hot button issues, um, nobody wants to have a nuanced discussion. Nobody wants to acknowledge that the reason that they're difficult is not because one side of the political spectrum are retarded. It's because it's a difficult issue, right? Um, keep things open or shut them down. It's not simple. If no. you think it is, you're the simple one. That's my closing remark. That's good. I won't top it. There. So, um, we, what is it? It's Thursday today. Tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow's think, Friday. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm working tomorrow or not. I think I am. I was just you and I have a little affidavit. project to work on tomorrow. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For uh, Divorce Mate, Tyler and I are involved in helping Divorce Mate uh, create documents, um, which is kind of interesting and uh, helpful at the same time. Their documents work really well. A little plug for Divorce Mate, uh, Child Support Guideline Calculators, and Family Law Document Preparation. No, we're not getting paid anything, although we might get some discount on our software if we help them. <laughs> 
Yeah, they, they actually are good. And I really like their uh, their online software, like their cloud software is fantastic. So check well, it out. Well, the cool thing I like is you're preparing documents and if you need to have the other lawyer's name in there somewhere, even if you haven't entered it, you start typing in Asif Muhammad, you know, the lawyer in Lethbridge does family, and it knows him because he uses the software. Right. Or someone else has added it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It's really and good. So yeah. that's kind of cool. And, uh, and yeah, I was a little skeptical, but I've been using it and uh, it's getting better and I'm getting better at using it. And I was just doing an affidavit actually on uh, Divorce Mate when yeah, I love it. we connected. So uh, yeah, I love it. So yeah, cool. Divorce Mate, go get it. Divorce Mate. All right. Well, uh, we'll call it a day and I think we've ranted enough and uh, we'll see if, again, as always, if you think we're full of shit, uh, send us a comment. Send us an email. Uh, we're big boys. We take criticism. That's right. All right. Cheers, everybody.